think, start by telling you something about his educational background. Langara sends a number of students every year to engineering physics at UBC, and it has a reputation of being the hardest engineering that you can take. Um, but they also have a reputation of uh, developing uh, new uh, techniques, new products, and uh, new companies. So um, I'm excited to hear about, uh, about uh, what uh, Raylai is going to tell us about. So, uh, yeah, thank you. So uh, nice to see you guys um, coming to my talk. Um, so you're probably wondering who I am. So I'm, um, that's my educational background, I guess. So I started out at uh, Sir Winston Churchill, just a few um, blocks that way. Um, and then I did my uh, bachelor's at UBC engineering. And so engineering, you may probably know, like after the first year, you get to choose your discipline. The, um, the discipline could be any of the traditional ones, like mechanical, electrical. And one of those is uh, engineering physics. And if you go into that, um, you get a little mix of both engineering and uh, physics from the actual the, the, the physics department. And then if you did that for the, you know, you go into that your second year. And then in your third year, you get to specialize once again. You get to choose between computer, electrical, and mechanical. And so then I chose electrical. Um, so after that, uh, I, did, I, cho um, I decided to do a master's. So basically during my, co but during my uh, undergrad, um, there's a whole bunch of co-op terms that I went on, and one of those was in a research lab at UBC that developed this technology. And so that's the, that is the lab that I went to first to try and approach the professor about getting a, uh, a master's um, uh, position. So I got it there, and my project there is wireless, so wireless, uh, wireless power. Um, so that took about two years, and it was really, really nice, and got my degree. And then I figured, well, this technology is really promising. Why I don't really want to just leave and, and go somewhere else. I want to stay on and see how this will develop because it's, um, it's going to turn into something really big. So I, so I basically asked the professor and he agreed to hire me as so-called a engin uh, research engineer. Hard to see this. So yeah, um, the, the fourth bullet there, I became a research engineer. So that's um, in the physics department at UBC where the, the lab is um, located. Uh, and so at that point, I became, basically became staff of uh, UBC, um, part of the research staff. And UBC, as you know, it does teaching, it also does research. So I became as from a student into a, into a staff member. Um, I did that for another three years, uh, trying to develop basically this wireless device that, is, that I've been doing ever since. Um, so basically my role, everyday role hasn't changed at all. I just, instead of student, I'm now staff. Um, and then the, finally, when uh, basically the funding ran out um, just uh, very uh, quickly for this, um, this research uh, grant, um, I, became, uh, I went out and looked for a job for the first time in my life. And I got the job at UBC Hydro. But today, I want to really focus on basically the, these two green uh, points, which is the, um, my involvement with wireless power. Uh, so, so basically, uh, when you ask me, am I a physicist or an engineer? I usually would say I'm an engineer. But I did do um, a short stint in physics, uh, being, having taken a master's in, in the physics department and such. And so this is, I, I figure I share this with you, is, um, is what my understanding is of what the difference is between physics and engineering. So if physics, if, um, I don't know if you guys are interested in this, but I figured uh, you know, someone might, is that, at least my take on it, is that physics, if that represents that blue blob, um, engineering is more like those little little blobs inside the big blob. So what physicists that I don't know if anyone is actually even interested in becoming a physicist, but in case somebody is or is, is flirting with that idea, this is sort of for, for you guys. Um, so you take this blue blob, and which which is like uh, which I envision is like the uh, the foundation. It's very flat. And engineering, the, what they do is they come along and they pick little pieces apart that physicist has already developed. And they, they build you know, really um, towers on top of that foundation. So and they take, take apart just a little bit of physics. So um, say a mechanical, they would just use you know, F equals MA or, or those types of, um, you don't use any of the astrophysics. They don't use nuclear physics. They just use a little bit. But they, make, they do it really, really well. And they basically um, uh, develop all these standards and codes and that make make everything um, 
uh, to a point where you can actually make use of those phys physical laws to make something useful. Uh, and so if you're a physicist, you don't actually care anything about what's in the middle of this blob, because that's old news. All physicists do, they, they, they work around the boundaries, and they're trying to in increase this boundary, whereas engineers, they come along and they try to build that tower higher and higher. And so once in a while, physicists working along this boundary, they would come uh, to a point where they make a breakthrough, and you basically increase the human knowledge. And so say with solid state physics, you, you, you know, conceptually you increase that blob, and, and part of that solid state physics is, uh, is the invention of transistors, for example, and that led to computer engineering or software engineering. So they opened up the whole bunch of uh, fields of engineering. And so basically uh, the engineers, they come along and, and they see this new development in physics and they come along and pick pieces of it apart um, and make something useful of it. Uh, similar here with particle physics, what developed into nuclear power. Uh, it all started on the blackboard, but those physicists that actually do that work, most of them, if they're, if they're purely physicists, once they've discovered that and they, they have increased that blob, they go and do something else. They don't actually go back and build nuclear power plants. They, they again, work on this boundary. They don't go back into, into the nitty gritty. That's what engineers do. And some, and some people are both engineers and physicists. So I'm just talking about pure engineers and pure physicists. So our, our wireless project, I would say, is not really engineering and not really pure physics. Because we don't work strictly within, say, the mechanical discipline. Um, but then again, we didn't, we're not increasing our human knowledge of physics either. We're not working on the boundaries. We haven't discovered anything new. All we have done is we took pieces of engineering that is before unrelated, and we coupled it together and did something new with it. So I'll go into detail about what our project really meant to be. Um, oh, so um, if you have any questions, just feel free to interrupt me. Um, otherwise, there's also a question period at the end. And so if you're still wondering, you know, what's a, what's a physicist, what's an engineer? So there, there's a, the picture I found of a physicist on Google, <laughs> Google Images. And so he's standing in front of some complicated piece of equipment. Um, so if, you, if you're thinking about being a physicist, you, you got to keep in mind you need at least a PhD or more. Um, that's almost one of the, the minimum requirements to, to, to be successful in this field. And you're probably going to be working at a university or a government lab or something that's really large and, and government funded. It's not going to be private because private companies, they can't afford to keep physicists or too many of them. And the titles that, that you may be working under could be, you could be a professor, you could be a research associate. Um, both of these, these require PhDs and professors. They need so-called postdocs, which is on top of your PhD. You need a one or two more of those that each last about a year or two before you could even be considered a professor. And if you want to be a professor, you really have to be the best at something in the whole world, whether it be, um, I don't know, earthworms. You have, to, you, you have to be the best in the world about that subject for you to become a professor. Um, the type of personality that you need, you need to be creative and theoretical. Uh, you don't, and it's a long-term usefulness for society. So you should not be bothered by the fact that what you're discovering may not be useful to anybody. Or it may be useful many, many years down the road. It may not be, even be useful in, within your lifetime. Um, but it's fun. So that's, that's, a phys, that's a physicist. So an engineer, um, you need less education. About a, you need a, a bachelor's. Um, which is about four to five years, which is probably what you guys are uh, looking into. And um, to be a professional engineer with that designation, you, you need another four years of experience working underneath a professional engineer. Um, and then you can work at firms that are, um, so there's more jobs basically in engineering. There you go. Sorry, what is Stantec? Stantec is a, is a firm. Uh, it's an engineering firm that does uh, public, a lot of public works. Um, bridges and such. Um, and so is uh, SNC-Lavalin SNC and BC Hydro. So they hire, hire a lot of engineers. Um, so right out of your, um, your bachelor's, your four years or five years of bachelor's, 
you could uh, go and find, try and find a, a EIT position, engineer in training. And so you don't have to get the four years right away before you go to work. You can work right after you graduate. And do, while you're in EIT, you get your four years of experience. And you're being paid. You know, it's, it's basically your career has already started. But you do need to spend that four years as an EIT uh, before you get your professional designation. And then you can become a junior engineer and then go on to a senior engineer, to a specialist engineer. This is probably the highest level that you could really achieve in your, you know, by that time you're 45, 50, you're looking for retirement. Um, or or uh, instead of being a specialist, you could be a, a manager of other engineers, managing um, uh, bigger projects. And the personal personality that you need for an, uh, to be an engineer is you need to be very detail oriented. So you, you can't be living up in the clouds um, like physicists and, and think about this and that, because and, that's a waste of time for an engineer. You've been given a project, you've given money and time to do it, and you've got to do it safely. You've got to do it with all due diligence. Um, so it's the, the, so you need to be very detail oriented. You need to um, you need to know all the codes and standards, which is very uh, is very numerous. And the reason why you do have to be so detail oriented is because public safety. When you're doing, say, if you're an engineer and you're building something, say like a, a bridge, or maybe a substation or something, there's nobody else that could check your work except for another engineer. There's nobody in society that has any authority over what you say. So you have that huge responsibility, you and engineering, you know, other engineers in general. When you're building something, society is putting a huge amount of trust in you to build it right and not have a high rise collapse or, or a bridge collapse. Or a bridge. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, because you go, it's always a, um, uh, a balance for, you know, you have, you, you have an amount of time, you have an amount of uh, funding, and sometimes um, some things just fall through the cracks. And so the, the, the public safety is a huge concern whenever you're an engineer. Um, and, and your things are, that you build are, are um, useful in the short term. So you can see that within your lifetime, you could, some things are very small, you can see it right away. Um, but other big projects, even like bridges, they take 10 years to build or something like that. But at least, you know, you see that within your lifetime completed. So that's my engineering versus physics um, section. And so uh, back to my project, it's, um, I would say it's, a, it's an invention. And so like our lab, what we do is, um, we, uh, I would say that we are inventors. But we, we, we work in very strict disciplines of, of physics and engineering. So when you think of an inventor, you sort of think of somebody that comes up with ideas and works in their garage and such. But for us, it's, it's a very um, academic and very um, strict process. So the process that we have for inventing something in our lab, I, what, this is what I have experienced in our lab, is that there's a, there's a process. And you come up with a huge, whole bunch of ideas, and you run it through this ringer of um, of the system, and you basically eliminate all the bad ideas. And so this is how the this is how the inventive process in our lab works. <coughs> you take an idea. When, once you first have an idea, it's completely worthless. No matter if you think it's a million dollar idea, it's worthless until you do something about it. So what you have to do is small experiments. This is what we did in our lab. So these these experiments they last for maybe no more than a day. And, and you know, I have to cost no more than $100 or something. It has to be something small, just to prove certain, certain things in your idea that, that is actually valid. You think they're valid, but you may never know. There may be other physics or engineering principles at work that you never thought of, and efficiency is almost zero or something <coughs> like that. So you run it through this ringer. On the other side, you have to do a patent and literature search, because this idea, it's amazing how, how many ideas have already been patented. So if, if, you, if you ever go through the patent uh, process and you look through all the patents that, that have been registered already, there's, there's probably, probably thousands of patents on sporks alone, spork and fork combination. It's just like if you have a good idea, chances are they're already patented. So you have to make sure that you check it first, because if you're trying to work through an idea that's already been patented, you're wasting your time. Because um, you'll be infringing on somebody else's patent and they could sue you. Um, so basically, you run it through this small experiment, 
you revise your experiment if if it's if it's you know if you can revise it, or it just straight up fails and you move on to your next idea, or the the pattern, uh, the literature search proves that it's already been invented and you and you just toss that idea away and you put a new idea in. The whole advantage of this is that because it takes such little time to vet these ideas, that you can have a huge number of ideas, and you basically run it through each one in a, in a time, timely fashion in order to um, eliminate the bad ones. And so if they both pass, that's, that's the time when you actually have a project. So in our lab, that's when actually a project gets started. Is, um, and then you start to maybe hire a co-op student or a um, grad student, in my case, where it comes, to, comes along and then uh, it develops that. And then even further down the road, you might seek for IP protection, which is you, know, you seek your own patent. Um, uh, you build demonstration projects, and basically you're trying to attract funding or partners that will help you develop this idea. Um, and you, you want to you want to see if there's any potential customers. Um, and then with those potential customers, you go to your uh, potential investors and say, "Hey, I have potential customers. Invest in me," and um, uh, you, you see your money get paid back. So, so this is. Further down this road, I don't have that much experience anymore because I'm just experienced up in here in the sort of the, the initial inventing process. What sort of ideas do you have? Like, what's an example of something that would turn into something interesting? This, I don't actually have too many ideas. Most of these ideas are coming from the professor. In this particular case, in my particular lab, this, that's how um, things come about. But like, you could, I don't know, like you could, uh, what other ideas are there out there that that turn big. Like you could have stupid ideas like different utensil combinations. Or you could have, I don't know, like um, in our okay, in our lab there's there's a few ideas that turn into turn into companies. One of them was um, solar lighting where um, so solar energy usually is, is concentrated on those solar panels and you turn it into electricity, right? But that efficiency is fairly low. Like the highest you get is ever is thirty percent or so. So or this idea that the professor had was um, to basically keep light as light, but use it and use it as light, so you don't ever convert it. But you have this very efficient way of concentrating it and, and feeding it through pipes in order to light your office building. So you don't. So it's it's very it's a lot more efficient, and uh, it's, it's cheaper. So that's one of those ideas. Uh, the other ideas could be um, electronic paper. So it's like the e-reader, right? As you notice, those e-readers they don't have they, they don't have video. Have you ever experienced that? Like if if you if you go to Amazon, you buy those Kobo things, you flip the page and it goes turns white and black, and then and then it comes to your page or something like that. Because there's a there's a fundamental limitation in that e-ink technology that goes like that you can't have color and you can't have video, and so our lab has some some ideas to to bring that about. So, so those, are, those are sort of those ideas. And, and I think this will apply to not just like high level physics related ideas, could be lower ideas like, um, I don't know, some sort of clip or something that you could, that doesn't require any engineering or physics, but you know, you can do in the back of your, um, back of your house. So back to my, my, the actual wireless power transfer. And so basically, we, what we have developed is a wireless power transfer device so that basically you don't have to connect your electric vehicle to the wall through a wire. You would just have to drive up to a station, and your vehicle will be basically compatible with the station. And, and through a few inches of air, power gets transferred. And so one of the first things that you have to ask yourself when you're inventing something like this is why do anyone want to do that? Because you don't want to invent something that's completely useless and nobody wants to buy. Right, so here's an electric vehicle. This is normally, this is sort of a picture of how they would get charged. It's uh, with a cord, you just connect it to, uh, I don't know, a pole or something. This is somewhere in the public. And so, you know, that seems pretty good. Why would you want, why would you want to remove that wire? Why can't you just plug it in every day? Well, you have to, you have to the first point there is convenience. And you have to think about it, for an electric vehicle, Unlike a gasoline vehicle, you have to plug it in every day. Or you, you might have to plug in twice a day if you charge at work, uh, if you live far enough that you have to charge at work. 
that's, that's very different from, uh, say, a, a conventional gasoline vehicle. You only charge it, or you fill up the tank only once every two weeks or three weeks. And so that convenience of that charging process is so much more amplified, the fact that you have to do it so much more often. Um, you can forget the charge, and that actually is the downtime. So it's not just a convenience thing. Because if you forget to charge one day, because, say, it's raining and you ran into the house and you forgot to come back to charge, you don't have a vehicle in the morning. You can't get to work. Um, there's also the theft and vandalism of the cord. Somebody could just cut it for the heck of it, or they could just steal it and sell it. Um, pedestrian safety. If somebody trips over that cord, who's the owner of that cord that caused you to trip? Well, it's the owner of the vehicle. So now you're liable for somebody tripping over your cord. Um, and also in, in, in like um, unfair weather like rain or snow, um, these wires, they have, they have these, um, obviously they have these uh, copper connections that um, could corrode. And it's just not, it's just not pleasant to do this in the, in the, in the snow. <clears throat> so how does this work? And so basically our device is, is, uh, is centered around magnets. So if you were to consider, so one way of explaining how this works is if you say, if you consider right over here on the left side a, um, a permanent magnet, and call that a transmitting magnet. And, you, and over here, this blue arrow represents the magnetic field <coughs> that it produces at this point. Right? And so you know, the, the field's aligned with the direction. It's called the dipole vector of this magnet. And so if you were to turn the first magnet, the magnetic field that you will measure on the other side will turn as well. It's just basic physics. Um, now, if you put a second magnet in that field that you were measuring at, and you turn the first magnet, the second magnet will rotate with the field that is, that is feeling uh, at, the, um, at the secondary side. And this, uh, just a detail that there's, a, a, there's, a angle. <coughs> there's an angle difference between the two. Depends on how much power is being transferred from one to the other. And so now, if you were to turn that first one, first magnet with your hand, the second magnet will turn as well. And if you put, I don't know, like a, a fan onto that mag, onto the second magnet, you're basically transferring magnetic, you're transferring mechanical power wirelessly from A to B without anything in the middle. So you already have wireless mechanical power transfer. An electrical power transfer, which is what we have, is just you add a coil on top, on top of the first and, and the second magnet. So the coil here in the first magnet would, uh, you drive current through it, the current drives the magnet, the magnet turns. That's the motor. And then, uh, so that's a motor. And so that, the, that's an established field in, in engineering. And then this magnet turning this other magnet is, um, is actually also a well-known phenomenon. It's called a uh, magnetic gear. And that's also a well-known field in, me in mechanical engineering or electrical engineering. And then the second magnet turns, which then turns inside this winding. And then a magnet in the winding that turns produces current. And that's called a generator. And um, so basically, all you, all you, what we have done is we combine the concept of a motor and a generator with the concept of a magnetic gear and applied it to an application of wireless power transfer, which has never been applied to in, in either of these two disciplines. So this goes back to the first, one of the first slides was where we had that blue blob of physics. And you have different engineering disciplines. And you can, you can basically not have to, you don't have to stick within each discipline, but you take a bits of here and pick a few bits of the other place and you make something new of it. So this is basically what, what I'm, I guess, um, arguing for is that we have done. And you turn them um, like that and you basically have wireless power transfer. And um, two, there's two surprising things about this. The first is that this is actually unique. So we, wouldn't, we didn't actually think that this is, Patentable. We would have thought them, somebody already thought of this, but it hasn't. So it's very surprising to us, and it's lucky for us, I guess. And we, um, the second thing is that you know you're going from electrical to mechanical to mechanical to electrical. And the efficiency must be very low, but it's not. The efficiency is. It, last time we measured it is around 92 percent, and it should be. With more engineering, I guess, it'll be higher. So we're aiming at 95. So there we go. That's how it works. So skip ahead maybe four years through all these little experiments that turn bigger and bigger and bigger. So this is the, the, um, the, last, the last demonstration project that we've done, which was the biggest. 
So here on the, f on the parking lot, you see uh, one, two, three, four charging stations. And so in each side, uh, inside each of these things that are mounted on the floor, there's a magnet and there's a winding. <clears throat> and the um, electrical power is basically being fed through this fat cable here. That's what the power is feeding. And then this little cable here is, is, uh, has the signals to basically control this, ma this uh, motor. So all it does is a, this thing here is like a motor, except it doesn't have a shaft of output. It's just it's, it's a motor that's basically useless, other than it, it just spins a magnet. And on top of that, as the car drives in, there's another one that's pretty much identical. And then basically the power goes in here. Uh, it drives the first magnet. The first magnet drives the second magnet through the magnetic gear. Um, so there's an air gap here of maybe three or four inches. And the, uh, the power goes out. Uh, you know, power gets induced in the, uh, in the coils of the second device. And then this coil, this coil then, um, the power then goes through this cord and goes to the battery charger. And then the, so it requires a little bit of retrofitting of the vehicle, basically putting in this device into the vehicle with some brackets and such. So this has been operating for a long while at UBC, and um, it's, it's, it's basically building on that demonstration, we've been able to get more support. Uh, so now I play a video. Um, so this video has been made by, um, UBC, there's a department called University Industri Industry Liaison Office. So what they, these people do is they take these ideas that have been developed at UBC, and if they have already achieved like a certain scale, they would help us by applying for patents and uh, developing industry contacts to basically build. Uh, basically, it, it, goes, it takes ideas from the university and, try, and it gives it to industry and create companies. This is what this department does. And this department <coughs> made this video for us in trying to um, uh, promote our technology. So here we go. The unique low frequency wireless power transfer technology invented and being developed at the University of British Columbia has a clear application in charging electric vehicles and has already been used to successfully charge a retrofitted Toyota Prius. In a new project funded under the NSERC i to i program, the research team is involved in a campus-wide collaboration with the University Industry Liaison Office and the Building Operations Group at UBC to prove out the technology in real-life usage within a fleet of electric vehicles. Normally, these electric vehicles are manually plugged in, often in cramped conditions. This can be inconvenient and without proper care and management can pose a potential safety hazard. In this demonstration, an electric vehicle that has been equipped to use the technology is approaching the charging station, highlighted by the yellow markings. To activate the system and begin recharging, the driver simply pulls up to the station. The system automatically senses the receiver unit mounted underneath the vehicle and switches on the transmitter. The audible signal indicates that the system has been activated. No physical contact is made between the receiver and the transmitter on the ground. As can be seen here, there is a tolerance for a degree of misalignment to accommodate normal parking situations. The power indicator lights up to confirm to the driver that charging has commenced. The driver can now simply walk away, confidently knowing that recharging is occurring. There is no need to access cords and correctly connect plugs in order to start charging. Charging occurs at the same rate as using a plug-in system, and the power transfer automatically stops when charging is complete. When the driver returns, he can simply start up the vehicle, now fully charged to 100%, and drive away without having to disconnect any cords. The entire process is automated and hands-free. This demonstration project has been running since December 2011, performing in a variety of weather conditions including snow, rain, and sub-zero temperatures. Due to this success, the system is now being rolled out in multiple vehicles in the fleet, utilizing improved designs of the charging unit. Okay. I think that's the end. So basically, that's um, as far as it goes for um, my presentation on, on this wireless power um, topic. I have a few slides more, but I, I'd like to pause and take some questions if you have any regarding the, um, the slides um, that I've done. So you have the, the magnetic fields of the two magnets communicating. What about the electric fields of the coils? I mean, do they not overlap? Do they extend less spatially? Oh, the, um, right. So let's go back to this. 
So the, the main interaction that is the strongest is the magnet to magnet interaction between the two sides. However, there is some interaction between the coil and the coil, right? That's, I guess that's your question. Yeah. Um, the, the interaction is definitely there, but it's very low. The reason for that is um, the frequency of, of the current that we are driving through the coils are, are mechanical frequencies, so you know, lower than 200 hertz. Usually, usually a motor runs at 60 hertz, right? But um, ours run at 170 hertz, but it's not, much, not that high. And the interaction between coil to coil really depends on frequency. So you know, like cell phones, they operate at gigahertz because that's, that's advantageous because the higher the frequency, the, the more sensitive um, your signal will be. So basically on the receiver, it's m easier to, to detect that signal. So for us, because we're operating at such a lower frequency, these electric fields that are being produced by the currents in the coil pretty much are just isolated to each device and not penetrating out that much. The thing that penetrates is the magnetic field from the magnet. I find it pretty remarkable that you, you get 92% efficiency from getting the electricity yeah. and powering a motor, which then powers a generator, yeah. which creates the electricity. So how do you manage to get that much efficiency when you're kind of going through a motor? For sure, yeah. So if you, for that, you, you should consider the, um, the efficiency of a good motor. So a crappy motor, say electric toothbrush, probably very low, I mean 20%. But if you have a good motor, say um, uh, a good induction motor, to, I don't know, 10 horsepower or something from GE or Siemens, they, they range, I don't know what the numbers are, but they, they easily have 92, uh, 95, 98. The bigger the motor, the more efficient. So well-built devices that are motors, you know, motors and generators are very efficient. And it's even more efficient for our case because we have, this is called a permanent magnet motor. So those motors that I mentioned in the past are called induction motors. They don't use any magnets. That saves in cost. But if you, you know, can spare the, the cost and use magnets, and this is basically called a brushless DC motor, those are known to be very efficient. So the motors and generators themselves are, you know, pretty good, 95 and above. So you have to, you have to multiply those efficiency together overall efficiency. And the efficiency between the magnet to magnet is actually, so this is a point that's <clears throat> sort of hard to explain, but it's 100%. Magnet to magnet mechanical power is 100%. If you, if you don't consider the friction. If you include the friction losses in the motor loss and the generator losses, then the losses between the, t the magnetic fields turning each other is zero. And that basically is, is where else is the, is the energy gonna go? If you spin one magnet, say if you're spinning one magnet, and you can, you, if you don't think about the friction losses, and you spin it in space, for example, it will spin forever. Does that have any currents in the metal fender of the car? Yeah, that does happen. Um, so we've, that's, does happen and we've measured it. And it's, um, it's less than 1% effect. Um, but yeah, if, if you consider ideal situation, they are 100% efficient, the, the manic to magnet mechanical. I think you were first. Yeah, so this, that's, yeah, this has actually been a problem at, um, at, uh, at that, that place where these things are all installed, this building ops. It's, uh, it's a place where UBC, like, you got your plumbers, your electricians and stuff, they go around and they take these little vehicles and they, uh, they basically, f they fix all the things inside buildings. And um, they're right next to a garage where they fix vehicles and some people just park in their spots. So in the real life, you need your dedicated spot. You need um, this. We, we envision the first, the first people <coughs> to actually buy this will have to install this in their own garage. And just, you know, and hopefully you can trust your family members not to park in your spot. <laughs> and then, and then um, you need, because you actually need permission to, to really install something in, in the ground, right? So it, that would probably be the first thing that's going to happen is people installing them in their own garages or in their own homes. And then that may escalate to people installing them in the public place. You know how there's electric uh, charging stations going up all around the city? So that sort of thing could happen for wireless. Um, 
could could not. Um, so yeah, you do need your dedicated spot, and you can park in other spots that are compatible. So all those four vehicles could park in each other's spots. For sure, <laughs> that's a problem we have to solve. Yeah, because that I mean that's a problem with 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 electric vehicles, right? As well, without even without this wireless stuff, somebody could park in your spot and, and take your power. Somebody could climb over the fence and take your power and go straight into the other guy's house and power their TV too. It's a problem. Um, how how bigger this problem gets with electric vehicles? Don't know. But uh, there's one way where you can have, you know, RFID tags. You can just use that. And um, it will basically only turn on if it's the right vehicle. I was just, <clears throat> I was just wondering if uh, part of the research that you did was uh, selecting the best frequency for rotation of your magnets. Because it seems to me that, as Todd mentioned, uh, um, eddy currents could be a loss. Yeah. And that would probably increase with higher frequency. Yeah. And so did you like plot out a power transfer versus frequency curve as part of your? Yeah, we, yeah, we have to do that very systematically. So. This, this device has been built sort of with, with the frequency dependence in mind, with the size of magnets, with the separation gap. There's are so many variables. It seems easy, but you, know, you can have a tiny magnet that spins three times as fast, but it may not be as efficient, but maybe cheaper. Which one do you go with, right? You just have to, I mean, one day you might, you might go this, this thing, you know, that's, this power level is about a kilohertz, kilowatt. So if you say you want one kilowatt, but you want to get it cheaper, it might go into a different size. It might use more than one magnet. It might use, it may do something else. So this may not be the best, best solution, the best compromise, but it's, um, it's, it's sort of early stages, right? So it's, we, we do the best we can, and then we optimize a little bit later in the next stage. Um, a company has been formed, yes, um, but I'm not sure about because I'm no longer I'm no longer officially involved because I work at BC Hydro. Um, but a company has been formed, and they are they have a I think they have a potential customer, although I don't know. But it's yeah, it's it's getting going. They are looking for investment, but they may be looking for a particular type of investment. Definitely far from being a public company. So, yeah. Also, I noticed in the video that you say the uh, the magnets account for like the different distances to parking. Yeah. So if you don't park perfectly, they also charge. Yes. Um, right. The question. Yeah. They do need to be within a limit of alignment. If you're too far away, the magnet is not going to be strong enough to influence each other. And so in that situation, you could have, this, so basically that, that goes back to basic controls. Right now the controls are sort of dumb in that it comes in, it detects a vehicle and it turns on, it's on or off. But you could have a situation later on where you're really perfecting this technology. If you're parking too far away, it, it can still work, but you just have to take less power. You have to, you have to charge at a lower rate. Or if you're really close, then you can, you can, you can up the power rate. Um, so yeah, that's that alignment is an issue. What's up? Yeah, I have two questions. First off, what what currently is the initial cost to start up this someone to buy or purchase the stand and the mount for the car? Yeah. And then because it's a mechanical technology, it's a it's a repurposed existing technology. Right. Do you see the price coming down the same way that computer processors and things of that nature? Decrease right. very quickly. Okay, yeah, um, I think I understand your question. So your first question is how much would this cost? So there's basically only four in the world, the one that you saw in the video. And so it's, it's hard to say how much it would cost. I can say how much those cost, which is a very high number, so I'm not even gonna tell you. Because it includes my salary. It, it, includes, it includes a lot of things, right? Everything is, is custom made. But 
I think the second part of your question is. <coughs> Yeah. As the, the, the material cost coming down. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, the in terms of how much it would realistically cost to a consumer, um, it would cost about the same as a motor and a generator, right? Yeah, so basically, that's super and and neodymium magnets, which which is inside most really good motors. So, all in all, uh, it comes down about to. Um, I think we're in, I don't know, we haven't done too much, but it should cost within a few hundred to a thousand dollars for a customer. I mean, considering how much a, a vehicle, I mean, back in the day, if you have a stock vehicle and you, and you say, I want, a, I want a ski rack, it costs you like three thousand dollars. Like, what the? <laughs> so I, that, that figure is totally within the ballpark of where you need to be in order to be consumer, um, to be successful with the consumer. Of course. <laughs> it's 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 definitely going to be a. Uh, I mean, the same questions are probably also been asked 20 years ago. Do you need AC? Are you going to pay five thousand dollars for AC on a vehicle? Probably not. No one needs AC, but now everybody has AC. So it it always starts out with early adopters, people that. People that are just like technology. They just may even be useless, but they just like it. And those people, they really are the one that starts off something like this. Say, like, you know, the same with cell phones. Very little people have cell phones. Like, why would you ever need a cell phone? You're going to buy your daughter, a 12 year old daughter, a cell phone? That's crazy. Right? But everyone has a cell phone now. So. Are the magnets powerful enough that nails and stuff would stick to the casing? Um, yeah, that's a good question. The, um, it, it's, well, those things have been operating in the field for, for almost a year now. And that hasn't been shown to be a problem. But I think um, if you were to actually place a piece of metal on there, it would stick. So it's, it's not a problem, but it's, it's within a certain consideration. So I think maybe in the future there's got to be some way of detection of detecting that there's some a hunk of metal is stuck on there, and then it won't it won't go up to full speed. It will tell you that something's wrong, and then you have to do is remove it. If you were to put say a, a loony or a piece of metal on there, would that make it uh, not work anymore? Would it stop? Um, would it affect the fuel? <coughs> if it's a, yeah, if it's like a, a small piece of metal, it doesn't really affect it. But it, what it does is it creates noise. Because if, say if it's, a, if it's a, a small nail, you put it on there, you turn it on, the nail's going to vibrate because the magnet is spinning. So you hear this horrible noise, and you probably shut it off and see what's wrong. So yes, like it's, yeah, you would have to take it off. And w will the technology work through surfaces, or does it need the air? Have you tried working through wood, or, tried, right. you, or through glass, or things of that nature? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, it, it works through. It has absolutely no problem with anything that's, that's uh, not metal. So glass, water. Water is another one, because what if instead of a vehicle, you have underwater, uh, underwater something, right? You can't, you, if, you, if you say you wanted to charge them underwater, because it costs a lot to bring some, a submarine back up, how would you charge that without, with wires, right? You, could, you probably, probably still do it, but it's, it's, you have to align something. You're going to have gaskets. I don't know what you need. But this one, you just two magnets. It's a little, a little simpler. Um, why don't I charge all my stuff with this? <laughs> right, good idea. Yeah, so there's, I mean, this technology that charges cell phones wirelessly, right? You buy this, I think it's called a power mat or something. You plug that mat in the wall, you put your cell phone on top of it. You have to retrofit your cell phone with, a, with something that has a coil in it or something like that, and you put it on and it charges. So it does, it, it, it could be, you know, vehicles, it could be, Laptops, um, but for this particular technology, there's the way that this thing scales. So if you say, I want to go from 100 watts to 1,000 watts, how much bigger does it need to be? And it turns out it doesn't need to be that much bigger at all. And so basically, then this technology, in terms of economics, actually it favors bigger applications. 
electric vehicles are even bigger. Yes. Right. Those are um, those are electric, they're mostly electric fields. So they they have so it's like this, except there's no magnets, and those windings directly interact with each other through very high frequency current. And so that that sort of technology that I think that works well in smaller devices. But once you get to the vehicle range, I mean you're beaming a kilowatt of power across this gap, right? Your cell phone beams about less than a milliwatt, right? And it's, it's just, it's, there's, some, there's some dubiousness in operating such, such heavy equipment at, at such high frequencies. So that's why I think we have an advantage because ours is, is low frequency. Okay, so Hopefully that answers all your questions. Now I have a few slides at the end, which is unrelated, but I think it's it's a bit it's a bit um it might be useful for you, maybe not. It would be complete uselessness, but um, optimizing ambitions. So I, so this is something that I I figured out throughout throughout. I, I'm only 28, so so like after graduation, maybe another spend another five years in the, in the workforce, I guess, maybe? So like, this is something that I've sort of found out and it may be useful to you, is that here on the horizontal axis, on the left here, I have less ambition. On the right, I have more <coughs> ambition, right? So like the, um, the example of a less, it's not really that less ambitious, but say just a regular person. Whereas on the right, you would have your, you know, your Steve Jobs or your Nicholas Teslas or your just huge people that are very, very ambitious, that usually do innovation, usually create companies. Um, very successful people. And you're trying to plot the happiness, right? What, what do you think that graph looks like? Right, so you may consider, say, income, very high on the right side, right? Reputation, you know, everybody loves you on the right side. So I thought for the most part of my days that a curve looks like this, right? So yeah, I don't know, maybe you guys think the same. But it's actually, I, what I found that is actually wrong. So, uh, so this is why I'm, I'm telling you this, because hopefully this will help you. Maybe, maybe it won't. Maybe for you, this is, it is a straight up slope. But for what I've found, is if, if I were to change this uh, horizontal axis to influence on happiness, and I say, what is the influence on happiness of these factors, income and reputation? It's actually not a straight line, but it does go up with, with um, ambition. But it flattens out at a certain point it's called the, um, you know, the, the diminishing returns. It's because if you think yourself, if, if you already have a lot of income, say you already have 10 Ferraris, what's one more Ferrari gonna do for your happiness? Just a little bit. But if you have no Ferrari, if somebody gave you one, this slope is very high at the, end, at the first, right? But then on top of that, you gotta consider all the negative things. To be, to be successful, say like a Steve Jobs, I don't know if you can see that at all. But over here, it says hours, and then it says uh, eight, eight hours a day. But for those people, they work all the time. It's a fact. They work every single waking hour. So that's, I don't know, you sleep eight hours, and the other, the other hours of the 24 you're working. There's a lot of stress, and the risk of what you're doing, because these people, when they, to be successful, you need to take on risk. Um, so that's, that's a huge stress for you. And if you graph that negative influence on your happiness, happiness, it goes something like that. And it goes up and up, and the slope goes, increases more and more because if you already have a lot of stress, just a little bit more stress is gonna push you over the edge. So that's why that slope goes up. That, at least that's my understanding. Could be different for you. And each person has a different curve. But what's the same is that it, if you were to plot the total happiness, which is income, which is your positive influences minus your negative influences, it's not a straight line, but it actually uh, maximizes a certain point in the middle. But the thing I think that's interesting, that might be interest of you guys, is that your education actually prevents you from moving up this curve. So if you were to aim here, and you, and you, you know, at that point, you can actually be better by being more ambitious, but you can't because 
because you're already working, you can't go back to school because you need more schooling to be more ambitious sometimes. So, and you up here, um, it's good. So basically, I guess what I'm trying to say is that you should try to figure out what your curve is, trying to get a sense of what this curve for you looks like, and just aim a little bit higher. So maybe up here. Because first of all, your curve that you, that you estimated could have been wrong. Um, if you, say if you're up here, you may have, you know, you have a lot of income and reputation, but you have no personal time. Maybe that's very important to you. Maybe you have a wife and kids. You need personal time, so you move down the, you move down the curve very easily. You just take less responsibilities. You move down the curve. But if you're down here already, you can't move up unless you go back to school. So I think it's, it's very important that recognize that there's a curve, or at least you, you may disagree with this, but I think there's a curve that looks like that. And just aim a little bit higher than that and, and, and um, fine tune it as throughout your career. So that's, that's my uh, presentation.